Hi, everybody. Welcome to Humane Voices, the official podcast of the Humane Society of the United States. Are we doing enough to prevent a future pandemic? That's what uh, that's the question that Carrie and I are here to discuss today. We have lived through what we're still dealing with a worldwide pandemic, and we know where this likely came from. But Did we learn our lesson uh, to prevent future catastrophes? To help us answer this question today is Rebecca Regnery, Senior Director of Wildlife at Humane Society International, part of our family of organizations here at the Humane Society of the United States. Rebecca, thank you so much for joining us for a topic that we just cannot seem to shake. Thank you. I I have been a huge fan of this podcast since it started, and I've always wanted to be on it. So I'm I'm fangirling a little bit here. Wow, Carrie, one of five fans, right? <laughs> right. The other five being the people who work on the pod. <laughs> right. Right. The other four and like our parents or something like that. Right, yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. No, my mom doesn't listen. She told me she doesn't. Yeah. Oh, perfect. Good. 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 <laughs> no, Rebecca, we're we're so glad to have you on uh, for such a. Um, a topic that just, like we said, it keeps coming back over and over again. So it's great that we get to discuss it with you today. I mean, literally, it keeps coming back, Austin. We're still locked in our houses, right? I mean, like, it, like we cannot escape this thing. And like, clearly, clearly, I mean, there was all this conversation towards the beginning of the pandemic about things that we could do better. And it's it, it's great. Becky, I mean, maybe you could talk about a little bit of, around, you know, what has been done about um, the, the wildlife issues that were kind of at the root of this pandemic. I mean, what, what is the, what, what is the animal connection here? Maybe you can give us some broader context for those who haven't tracked this. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, it, it, it was all started from our, I'm going to say inappropriate relationships with Mm -hmm. wild animals. Um, wild animals naturally carry a lot of diseases and lots of them don't affect the wild animals at all. Uh, But when we mix with wild animals and keep them in captivity and stress them out, um, we risk having these diseases spill over. That's what they call it, spill over to humans, and it can cause outbreaks or even pandemics. And it happens over and over again. Mm. This is just the most recent. And that's the thing, because I remember in the past, you know, we've had... um, uh, we've had MERS, we've had SARS, we've had, you know, Ebola, all of these are potentials for this viral illness to be passed from human or from animal to human, correct? That's right. And, uh, it goes even farther back, even the 1918 influenza pandemic came from animals. Okay. So those, those kinds of diseases have a name, Rebecca, what is, what is the name of those diseases that transfer from This isn't funny at all, except (laughs) that I've been working in this field for 20 years and I still cannot say this word. It's zoonotic or is it zoonotic or is it zoonotic or is it genotic? I I don't know. I like I like it when you when we can use the noun form, because that way we get to say zoo noses. Yeah, there it is. <laughs> right? That's like zoo one. noses, like a bunch of noses at the zoo. <laughs> I like that version. Yes, not a funny, not a funny topic, but a, a rather amusing word. Yeah, but uh it's not just like a, a crazy occurrence. I think a real a real big issue here is that they all start the same way, which is this intense confinement. All these mm-hmm. animals are very close together, correct? Yeah, so um a lot of the last few that you mentioned, the SARS, the MERS, um, Ebola, not as much Ebola, but probably Ebola. I think we don't know as much about the origins of that, but they all started or at least were spread in these um, markets that sell live wild animals. Um, these these animals, I've been to a few of them. They're, you know, they're kept in small spaces. It's really unhygienic. Um, they're filthy, you know, Mm. and, and they're, um, and they're really stressed. So it's a lot like I was in, um, lockdown actually. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, totally. (laughs) Rebecca, I, you know, I haven't been to, I, I I went went to a live animal market in Peru once. And I remember just sort of Mm. thinking, not only is the kind of the suffering that you see in, in some of these places, like just really hard to, to take in, but it's, 
the sort of um, the hygiene issues just struck me as being like, really like, I mean, there's standing water in a lot of places. The animals are really close together. I mean, it just struck me as all the things that you sort of are told repeatedly to, to not necessarily get too close to. Yeah, I think I've been to the same one in Peru um, mm. and a lot of others. Yeah, you just, I guess people who are used to them get desensitized. But for those of us who that isn't a part of our daily life, it's it's shocking. Um, mm-hmm. You just see the animals, they're, they're covered in feces, they're, um, they're confined in really small wire cages. You can just tell how stressed they are. Sometimes they're slaughtered right there in front of, their um, cage mates and there's blood and it's it's horrific. It, it's it wasn't the first time that this has happened. Like you said, it's happened in the past over and over again. So can we talk a bit about what governments have done in the past or are they trying to improve and correct the mistakes that have happened? Yeah, well, SARS, which is related to COVID-19, um, happened in 2003 in um, a very similar situation, started, um, we think, in a live wild animal market in China. And after that, China temporarily banned uh, live wild animals in markets, but it was temporary. And once SARS faded away, they opened them back up again. Mm -hmm. Um, And they, they again have, have banned them after, after COVID-19, but only in certain situations, only when they're being sold for food, which is important, but not when they're being sold for medicine or pets or um, other uses. Um, And lots of countries haven't banned it at all. Um, You can Google, live animal markets in Indonesia and see some pretty horrific images. Rebecca, are there, you know, I was just thinking, you know, some of the stuff we were just talking about, about the conditions that we we've seen in some of these places. Um, you know, I, I don't think that I have been to a live animal market in the U S where animals were bound for food, but I have been to a, a quote flea market that sold puppy mill puppies and um the they were kept in really atrocious conditions and up close with other animals really cramped um and i the in terms of you know the final outcome you know maybe you could argue that the the, the puppies are likely to end up a slightly better place even though it's it's not good that you know people are buying them but it it did make me think you know like there's a there's sometimes this sort of i think um uh, idea that these these things are only happening overseas and I, can you give us in some perspective about whether this is happening domestically at all yeah there there are unfortunately live animal markets in the US um they're mostly selling amphibians and mm-hmm. reptiles and fish um mm-hmm. in fact i'm sure you have been to one that sells fish if you think about it mm-hmm. um hmm. but, are you um, hinting at something i'm trying to think about <laughs> have i been to one that sells fish I feel like you're hinting at something and I'm missing. What am I missing? <laughs> well, you, you go to seafood markets and they they often have live fish. Oh, lobsters. right. Of course, yeah. right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. That's a really good point. Yeah, but um, really the, the highest risk animals or species, I would say, uh, for spreading these, these um, deadly genotic diseases. <laughs> Love it. My I don't favorite know, one. I still don't know My how to say favorite it. variation, yeah. <laughs> Zoonotic. <laughs> Zoonotic are mammals and birds. Mm-hmm. Okay. So, and, and yeah, and viruses don't care if it's sold as food or as a pet or as medicine or as anything. If the conditions are right, this, this is a recipe for another catastrophe. Yeah. Vir- viruses are very opportunistic. They don't mm-hmm. care what the animal's there for, or what the humans are doing with the animal. Um, or if it's being, if the sale is legal or illegal, mm-hmm. um, sustainable, unsustainable, viruses don't care. Rebecca, what is it about these markets that that kind of, um, what is it about the specific conditions that make them sort of such a breeding ground for, for these kinds of viruses? Well, like I said, they're unhygienic. So there's mm-hmm. a lot of body fluids mixing. Um, mm-hmm. there, there can also be multiple species crowded together. And because they're stressed, um, 
if they get sick at all, they're more likely to shed the virus mm. more mm-hmm. uh, and, and they have lower immune systems. So there, it's really a perfect breeding ground for viruses. Viruses couldn't be happier that these exist. And, and influenza is also a virus. Yeah, this uh, this is uh, flashing back to the to the live uh, the the quote flea market, which really was appropriately named in the case that I went to of this one place in Texas. I I still remember walking between these aisles of of animals and something um, splashed into my mouth, <laughs> and I was sick for I mean three weeks. I had this respiratory illness that I I'm like, yep that is, that's where I got that. No question there. I mean, I'm lucky I wasn't patient zero in, in some new, you know, domestic pandemic. You are. I've, I've been to one, um, where they breed sea turtles in, um, in the Cayman islands. And Mm. I touched the sea. I was there for research, not because Mm. I wanted to be, Mm. and I reached and I touched one of the sea turtles just to see if there was a wound on its back. And I got really sick also afterwards. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure it's, it was from that positive. Yeah. These poor animals. Uh, yeah, really. Well, so Rebecca, obviously there are, it seems like a wild west in terms of regulations. I, what are the safeguards here? Can we talk a little bit about uh, how to protect the consumers or the, the poor animals that are being put through the suffering? The frustrating thing is that it's really easy. Mm. Just ban the sale of live wild terrestrial. And I'm going to say terrestrial because if you ban seafood, people would lose their minds, even though I would be happy if they did, (laughs) but ban the sale of live wild terrestrial animals in urban markets and the commercial breeding um, of wild animals, again, terrestrial wild animals. It, it would be easy, fairly easy to do it when it costs that much money. Um, China, when they banned it most recently, they did buyouts for the farmers Mm. breeding wild animals, kind of like we do with the um, Korea dog markets. Mm -hmm. Um, It it wouldn't be that hard. And yet there's a lot of resistance to it. And apparently we haven't learned our lesson yet, even with 5 million deaths in the current pandemic. So what's the resistance coming from? Like, if it is relatively easy, you know, like who who would be opposed to stopping this? I mean, both on the sort of animal suffering and the human health front. Uh, there's a group, um, the, the people that I come up against the most, there's a group of very vocal and well-funded specialists that strongly advocate for no restrictions on the sale and trade in wildlife. Um, they they argue livelihoods. They argue that there are bigger risks like climate mm-hmm. change and loss of habitat, which is true. But this is something really simple that could be done. And the I, logic I there don't just doesn't it. like it's like okay, there's another risk. So why address this risk? I mean, what? Uh, sorry, I'm not following that trail of logic yeah especially say i mean if these pandemics become more regular and these variants keep getting worse and worse aren't there financial impacts already to from the pandemic to rural communities yeah yeah i looked it up and um they say that the wildlife trade the entire wildlife trade minus um seafood and furniture and fashion uh is worth about $11 billion a year. And the global cost of dealing with this pandemic has been more than $5 trillion a year. So it's it should be a no-brainer. That's a staggering number. Jeez. Okay. So, Rebecca, are there governments that are doing better than others? Like, are there some places that are making better headway and then others that are really sort of digging their heels in? Yeah, even though I, I, I think China hasn't quite done enough, um, it's huge that China has banned the sale of wild, live wild animals mm-hmm. um, in markets, in urban markets, and the commercial breeding of wild animals for food. Uh, other countries have taken steps. Um, other countries have banned the sale of certain types of wild animals. Um, uh, I think a couple, I have this written somewhere, like Gabon and um, South Korea have banned mm. the sale of some wild animals. Um, Vietnam has banned the sale of imports of live wild animals. So I, I do have hope that we're going to make progress. It's just not happening as 
fast as I had hoped, but I also fear that once, hopefully, once we get this pandemic under control, that it'll go back to business as usual, like it did after SARS. Mm. It's a bit nerve wracking here. So, well, I guess, again, the big question is, and, and, you know, we've spoken a little bit about it, but we have to answer the title question. Are we doing enough to prevent another pandemic? And if not, how can we really help a lot of the listeners here that are listening to this episode? What can we do actionably to help change this? The answer is heck no. I was told that I can't use a stronger word than heck. <laughs> um, what we can do, I mean, I'm preaching to the choir here, I know, but don't eat exotic animals. Um, don't buy or wear products from exotic animals that are bred in captivity like fur. Uh, mm-hmm. Their Fur farms have been overrun with COVID. And mm-hmm. the only place that I know of where animals are transmitting COVID to humans instead of the other way around. So that's a big risk of mutations. Uh, The U.S. has uh, um, a bill pending called Preventing Future Pandemics Act, or as I like to call it, PUFPA. (laughs) (laughs) Support PUFPA. Support PUFPA. That's a good rallying cry. I love it. (laughs) You can pronounce it too. It's not like zoonosis. That, that's because I made up my own pronunciation. <laughs> that's the key. Make yes. up your own words and you know yeah. how to pronounce them. I like it. Uh, so so if you live in the U.S., you know, call your representatives, contact your representatives and senators and ask them to support that. It is getting broad support. Uh, and other countries are also considering um, similar measures. That's another word I don't know how to say. Is it measures or measures? Mm, we can just up. invent it. Let's just make it up. Also, the WHO, and I'm not talking about the rock band, but the, the World Health Organization has put out a call to national governments um, that says, I'm going to read this because I don't want to mess it up. Calling on all national, it's not just the WHO, sorry, it's not just the rock band, it's also the UN Environmental Program and the um, World Organization for Animal Health has put out a call to all national authorities to suspend the trade in live caught wild mammals for food or breeding and close sections of markets selling live mammals for food. Mm. So heed that call. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, it's a serious warning because this, this is a, a horrible cautionary tale, and I hope that we can really heed the the impact. I mean, I, I just I can't believe, Gary, that we haven't been in the office for over a year. I'm in the office now. right now, but oh, no one oh, else you is. Are. You're right. You're right. <laughs> right. You're the lone, you're and the I'm I'm in a person. sealed room, so I won't encounter other people because of uh, exactly this phenomenon of people doing bad things to animals. Right. Exactly. So, uh, Rebecca, were there any other uh, um, words or topics or things that you wanted to cover before we wrapped up today's episode that you felt was important to add? Just again, I'd like to stress how many people have died from this pandemic. Mm -hmm. And um, and that's just the people who have died. How many people got sick? I read something recently that in the U.S., um, 140,000 children have lost their caregivers. So it's 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 a huge crisis and it's really upsetting. And one of my friends recently had her two year old son die from COVID. Oh, my gosh. I'm so sorry. That's incredible. Yeah. Yeah. It's just I it makes me angry and it makes me want to curse. And just what does it take for people to take action? Right. Especially given that you're describing that this is a relatively easy ask. And you can Google um, opponents to closing live wild animal markets and find people. You can find them on Twitter. It's oh, mind blowing to there's me. There's a lot of nonsensical stuff happening out there in the world. Well, you gave us you gave us uh, some hope here. Um, it seems like there are a lot of people that once they are aware of what's happening, they can really make the change and spread the word about doing positive change. So that's the most important part. And 
Rebecca, we're glad that we uh, we could have you on today to talk about a really relevant and important topic right now. So thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for helping me get that message out and for helping me learn the best pronunciation of genotic. Thank Absolutely. you for teaching us how to pronounce poofpa. We appreciate that. <laughs> <laughs> You're very welcome. Oh, wonderful. Rebecca Regnery, Senior Director of Wildlife at Humane Society International, part of our family of organizations at the Humane Society of the United States. That's all we have for today's show. Uh, for more helpful information and let's change that, uh, you know, uh, for the future, let's not have another pandemic. Be sure to find out more information at humanesociety.org for tips and tricks. Thanks again for tuning in and see you next time on Humane Voices. Humane Voices.